This is the record collection that invented hip hop. This is the place that people will want to go to get the clearest understanding of how this culture began. We are preserving this stuff, not just for us, but for future generations. After we pass on to the essence, that it be something still left for human beings could go and find out what was the vinyl, or what made this whole movement called hip hop tick. This is Brother Africa Bambada, the almighty universal Zulu nation, the Amin Ra universal hip hop culture for your mind, body, and soul. Crate diggers, understand. This is three stories tall and two layers deep on each side. Among materials like this is where Africa Bambata's archive will reside. Bam was a DJ from a very young age. He enjoyed music. He grew up in a very musical household. His parents' record collection was really diverse, so he started getting into um, sounds that were sort of off the beaten path, so to speak. My parents, I say my mother bought that first record, I guess, like Too Many Fish in the Seas by the Marvelettes. I think she bought like the first 200, and I came with all the other thousands. I used to buy a lot of the different um, um, funk groups that was happening at the time, like the great Sly and the Family Stone, the God James Brown, many of the Motowns, uh, early Stacks folk record sounds like the Otis Reddins and the Bar Kays and Isaac Hayes and, and the Vita Franklin and and I was crazy about Curtis Mayfield, the Isley Brothers. So, you know, a lot of early funk, and, and on, on the rock side, it was Creedence Clearwater Revival, um, Grand Funk Railroad, and, um, and the Rolling Stones. So I was heavy into many of the different groups that was happening at that time. You can see um, the diversity of Bambada's record collection. That's actually one of the biggest hallmarks of DJ Africa Bambada, who was originally known as the Master of Records. Fania Records, right? The Super Salsa Singers. Sonny Ade and his African Beats, right? How many of you knew Phase 2 made a record? Well, we like these. We like when the record, when the jacket is all beat up because you can tell that he used this record a lot. It traveled with him a lot. When you look at the span of music, the knowledge that Africa Bambata has as a DJ that was influencing the music that he was not only producing himself, but influencing others to produce is here. I definitely knew I was doing something, breaking all styles of music to many different audiences that I played for. I knew something definitely was happening in, in the streets. It was more on um, picking out the different sounds of what I was hearing from the radio station and what I wanted to um, play for my audience. So giving that different sound, taking them on a musical journey. My audience used to always look for something wow to be played at the party. And, you know, I could take you from, you know, let's go back and dance like your mom and papa used to do. Then I might jump into something of Chubby Checker. I might play something of Bo Diddley. Or I might even jump into a commercial like Mountain Dew or the Pink Panther or Sweet Georgia Brown, even before it was a name called hip hop. You hear DJs say, yeah, he's the one that taught us how to rock a crowd. He's the one that taught us that you should play a variety of music. Some of Bam's records are still in these travel cases, uh, never unpacked from particular trips that he took to various locations around the globe. So uh, the records that are inside of these cases, and we have several on the shelf, several here, those will never be separated from these boxes because those are actual sets that he created uh, at a particular point for a particular purpose. In the uh, mid-90s, techno was ruling like crazy, especially in Italy, Italia. And I uh, played at this big stadium, and I wanted to see, um, I was like the 39th or 40 DJ, and I said, you know, I know these people have been probably going crazy, even though they're all dancing to the techno and this and that. They probably want to hear some other stuff. So when I came on, I started with um, losing my religion. Then I see them like was screaming, going crazy, hear some other stuff. Then I started drawing other things from the Vita to the Jacksons, bringing them to the hip hop, and then brought them back to the techno for the next DJ to be on. So it just showed me that just go on and, and try what you need to try in your audience. They will let you know if, if they like what they're hearing or they want you to hurry up and get that stuff off 
and play what they was listening to. We found um, records like this in the same box right next to records like this. Dig it. Yeah. My audience uh, definitely knew that I was crazy and, and I would swing something on it. And even if they didn't like it, I always knew how to come back in and play with another song. Um, There's like a song I have from this group from the Philippines um, called Please, called Eagle Tripping. And it didn't grab everybody at first, but I just kept coming with that groove and that beat. Then I jumped into something else and come back with it to it became a hit dealing with my audience and then became a hit among other hip hop DJs. What we call the brainwashing technique. We got 638 boxes in the Bambata archive that again, they arrived just a few weeks ago. They have not all been gone through yet. Just gonna pull a random box off the shelf and we'll see what's inside um, so everyone can get a sense of what kind of things we're dealing with when we dig through the Bambata archive. Uh, Alda Reserve. Now, you gotta have your James Brown sex machine. And this jacket is in particularly bad condition, which is a good thing. It tells us a lot about how it was used. It was so revered that they wanted to tape it up. Obviously, everybody knows Bam is using a lot of James Brown. Every, every hip hop DJ should be using some James Brown, right? Ahead of our time, this is informative. This, this type of thing, plus uh, the Zulu movie with Michael Caine, all of that sort of stuff sort of informs a young Africa Bam Vada uh, to develop into who he developed into. Here in the rare and manuscript vault, we have separated out some of the heavily annotated um, records from BAM's archive. This box um, was labeled Zulu Sure Shots. Um, so these would be records that Bambata himself would have annotated um, with something called Zulu Nation, Funky, a lot of them actually say Sure Shot on them. And I'm doing this randomly. So Bam used to label, or write his own ownership on each of these. You can see his rating system here. These are the songs he likes. So we'll have to be very careful with these. Obviously he's blocked out the label. Everybody knows back in the days, DJs would wanna obscure what they were playing so that the other DJs could not gather the intel. Dion. This album belongs to Bambada Kayana Singh. This is number 620 of his collection. And this is before he had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. I think he stopped numbering somewhere around 2000, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I get no too competitive with myself because I, I already had um, more grooves than everybody out there. Other DJs trying to find out uh, what songs Bambada was playing. You know, a lot of other DJs, if I heard the song or if I seen a certain cover, I knew if, if that cover looked like Polydor Records or if it looked like a Columbia record, I could hear a certain sound or a way a person was singing and knew how to go and research and find that. That's what made the fun out of digging in the crates. You know, you might have heard a grunt or you might have heard a high voice or something. You don't know if that was Aretha or if that was Shaka Khan if that was uh, a heavy metal guy singing a high note or something. So you had to look for all that. And that's what made the fun of digging in the craze and researching for the music you want. It's a time when I went and put these Harry Grishina records and all these um, other diggers in the crate people was in the store following me. And um, when I bought the two vinyls of the Harry Grishina, everybody started yelling, yeah, I want that, I want that too. I said, yo, don't get that, you know, this is, you know, Harry Grecian record, I'm just gonna check it. And everybody think I was jiving and playing the people. So they all went and bought it. I don't know what happened when they got home, if they enjoyed the music or not. Of course, we understand that today, hip hop is everywhere. Hip hop is something you see at the halftime show at the Super Bowl, the most mainstream of things. And you can buy graffiti on a t-shirt at Walmart, right? So how did all that begin? We have the story right here in the original artifacts. So 
here is an actual handwritten copy of the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln. These are about 5,000 years old, and since it's on a portable item, that essentially makes these the first books. And here is a Egyptian papyrus scroll. The question is, how on earth could vinyl records, in particular hip hop records, be given the same weight and significance historically as a document like this? In the same way that we're looking at this with wide-eyed uh, amazement and enthusiasm, hundreds of years from now, thousands of years from now, people are gonna be looking at these strange vinyl discs and saying this contains a window into uh, what the world was like back then.